Okay, so today's lesson is about topic 6 and 16, and that is kinetics. Okay. And what we're really focusing on here with kinetics is a few different concepts. And so we're going to kind of outline, bullet point those things that we're going to try to talk about, and then um, kind of explain each one more in detail. So kinetics consists of... Collision theory, factors that affect reaction rate, the concept of activation energy, um, graphing reaction rate and then Maxwell Boltzmann curves. Maybe not in that particular order, but that's kind of the things that I have here. Okay. But so for SL, these are the main concepts that you have to do. So the first thing you want to establish in kinetics is what is required for a reaction to occur. And that's the definition of collision theory. And so collision theory states that for a reaction to occur, two particles must collide. Emphasis on two. Okay. We rarely have a reaction where three particles have to all collide simultaneously for a reaction to occur. We're always assuming that the odds of that are so low that we can only have two particles collide at one time and then causing a reaction. So for a reaction to occur, two particles must collide. That's the first concept. With the two following um, requirements. One, the correct orientation. Okay. So when two particles collide, the atoms that are reacting to form new bonds and breaking bonds, they have to collide in that correct um, alignment. Okay. So for example, if you've got, let's say, this atom and this molecule, and then you form this and this, okay, this is an example of a single replacement reaction. And so the green dot is reacting with the pink and blue dot to form a pink particle and then a blue and green particle. So for this to occur, the green particle has to collide with the blue particle side. And so it has to collide with this side so that it forms the bond with the blue particle atom and then can break the bond with the pink. So the first thing is the correct orientation so that you have to, you have to collide that way. If you don't have the correct orientation, you can already kind of rule out a reaction occurring. The second thing is the correct amount of energy, okay? And so when I say correct, I mean activation energy, which is defined as the minimum energy required for a reaction to occur. And so in every reaction, 
there is a difference in energy state between the reactants and products. And we'll talk about that kind of graph in a little bit. Um, and you must overcome that difference in energy for a reaction to occur. And usually you have to put in, you have to put in more energy than either state to set that into motion. Okay. This is where you see the energy diagrams that you may recognize from um, previous units. And so when you have an energy diagram that looks like this, you have a state for your reactants and your state for their products. The products don't have to be lower than the reactants, but in this case they are. That energy required to go from the reactants to the products in the forward direction is known as your activation energy. And this point at the maximum energy state Yeah, thank you. Okay, transition complex, oh, transition state, or the activated complex. So the, the scenario in which you're at the highest energy before the reaction actually goes to completion is called the transition state or the activated complex. And it's, it's more of a theoretical thing. It's not necessarily something that you can observe, but it just has to happen. So for example, in the analogy I had before with the correct orientation, there is a brief moment in time where all three atoms are bonded to each other. Like there's some instant where when the green is forming its bond with the blue, the pink bond is also breaking at that exact same time. In that moment where all three things are bonded together, that's the highest energy state. And at that point, the blue could go with the green or it could just go back to staying with the pink. And so at that moment, any direction is possible. And that's the transition state or the activated complex. On this energy diagram, there are a couple of other things that you need to know as well that you may, know, um, that you may recognize from a previous topic in enthalpy. The difference between the products and the reactants is your delta H, your enthalpy. Okay. And that, that difference right there between the reactants and the products <coughs> is a set value. It doesn't matter what pathway you go. It doesn't matter how many steps it takes. If you go from the same reactants to the same products, that delta H will never change. That value, the amount of heat that's lost or gained in the overall reaction will not matter. Okay. But that activation energy may change, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Now, you have to think about the activation energy in the forward reaction. And also you kind of have to take into account the activation energy in the reverse reaction because all these reactions are theoretically reversible. That you can go from reactants to products or products to reactants. But in this scenario, which is an exothermic reaction because you're losing energy overall, you're more likely to go forward because it takes less energy to reach the activated complex. Yes, Ada? Are there like times when like the forward and the reverse reaction need the same activation? Um, in real world, no. Now some do have a very small difference in energy. Like I believe the conversion of carbon to diamond, I mean graphite to diamond, takes like I think like negative one point two kilojoules net. So even though it takes like thousands of degrees Celsius, but the actual net difference in energy is really, really small. So the, diff the gap between the R and P would be very small. But to have a reaction that's exactly equal in both states is highly unlikely in kind of real world. But theoretically, yes, you're right. They could be the same. Okay. Questions on the labeling of this diagram and the energy state here? Yes? So when you're writing down the activation energy for one direction and the other direction, Correct. is that the same thing? Oh, um, notation here, 
I don't think you'll actually have to label this. More than likely than not, this will be a multiple choice question where they'll just label like different lines A, B, C, and D and say which one represents the activation energy of the reverse reaction or the forward. If they ask you to label it on there, I'm assuming that the test will state how they want you to notate it. They'll say like put a star to represent the reverse reaction or something like that. There's no string. No, there's not a defined convention to label it, right. Okay. So, these two things are the import, the things required for a reaction. Once two things collide in a system, whether a reaction occurs or not, the correct orientation and the correct amount of energy. And these fundamental things explain why reactions speed up or reactions slow down. And that's what we're going to talk about next because this all leads to, well, we need to know how fast reactions occur, okay? And so that leads us to what's called reaction rate, or the rate of reaction, okay? And that is the change in concentration of a reactant or product per unit time. So, how much time, how much, how much molarity has changed per unit time? And you could do concentration, they, the, the IV defines this concentration, but you can really measure a lot of different changes. It can be change in mass, it can be change in color. There are a lot of different things, but we kind of keep it for our purposes here, change in concentration. So the unit for this would be um, moles, decimeters to negative three cubed, seconds to negative one because moles per decimeter cubed, moles times decimeters to negative three is molarity, and then seconds to negative one is the denominator here. Okay, so that's our general unit. And again, you should get used to writing all your units expanded out. So don't write capital M as molarity anymore. You wanna write it out as moles times decimeters to negative three. Okay, and so that's what we're measuring here. Okay, and so, What we're going to talk about first are the factors that affect reaction rate. Okay. The factors that affect reaction rate. Now, these factors that affect reaction rate have to do one of two things to the collision pit. They either have to generate more correct orientation or they have to give the particles more energy. That's why the reactions occur more quickly because like we said before, the collision theory states that a reaction only occurs if you have the right amount of energy and the correct orientation. So all these factors we're gonna talk about do one or two of these two things, okay? They either one, increase the frequency of collisions. Okay. If you increase the frequency of collisions, then there are more particles that are colliding with the correct orientation. So, and I want you to underline the word frequency. It is not more collisions. It is more collisions per unit time. That's why you say frequency and not just say, I don't say more collisions, I say frequency of collisions. Like there's 100 collisions per second versus 50 collisions per second. The number of collisions itself without a unit of time doesn't really affect it. So these factors either increase the frequency of collisions, so therefore you're increasing the number of collisions that have the correct orientation, or you're increasing the energy of the particles, which means more have the activation energy to react. So all five of these factors are affecting one of these two characteristics. Are you giving more particles 
Uh, are you allowing more particles to meet the activation energy requirements, or are you giving particles more opportunities to collide so therefore there's more chances that it will collide correctly? Those are the two main ideas. And so, you probably recognize some of these factors. And so, one, is concentration, okay? So, if you increase the concentration of a solution, which factor are you affecting here? Frequency, Frequency of collisions, exactly. So, the, if you increase the concentration, you are increasing the frequency of collisions. You are not changing how much energy each particle has, you're just putting more particles there so there's more collisions per second. So increase the concentration, increase the frequency of collisions. So when you increase the molarity of a solution, you will increase the frequency of collisions, so you should increase the rate of reaction. Okay. Two, okay. Um, Surface area, okay? So granulated sugar versus a sugar cube, okay? Which, which explanation does surface area improve? Frequency, uh, frequency. frequency of collisions, you got it, okay? Now, terminology-wise, with, with surface area, the IV kind of says it in two different ways. And so this can either be say, said by increasing surface area or decreasing <coughs> the particle size. Those two things are the same. And so they, they, so what they argue is like a sugar cube being grounded up into granulated sugar is decreasing the particle size of um, and the increase in the contact. So they may say either way. They may say directly increasing surface area or they may say decreasing particle size, but those two things mean the same thing. And conversely as well. Okay, three. This um Actually, I guess this is volume slash pressure here. Only works for gases because pressure has very little effect on liquids and solids because the particles are already so close that it doesn't really change how often things collide. So what you want to look at is for gases, they're so spread apart that pressure does have an effect on this. and. Volume and pressure, again, in, it affects the frequency. Mr. Sean, yes? Does it also affect the energy? No, um, because what we're going to assume, that's a good question, because I, I, I know where you're thinking about like pressure and volume are indirect, or like directly related to temperature, <laughs> but we're assuming at constant temperature here. So that's, that's a good question. So we're going to assume this, that the pressure and volume are <coughs> affecting each other and temperature is staying the same. That's a good point though. So here, if we increase pressure or decrease volume, it increases the number of frequency of collisions. So yeah, like Mofe said, let's assume that temperature is constant here. Temperature is constant. Now, Two more factors. <coughs> temperature, okay? What does temperature affect in your collision theory? Okay, both of them, right? So both factors here, it not only affects the energy of the particles, which means more have the activation energy, but it also increases frequency of collisions. 
Okay. Now, if you had to guess, which factor you think do you think is more important in affecting the reaction rate? Energy. energy, right? Because if you increase a bunch of frequency of collisions, if they still don't have enough energy, it doesn't matter. So, if you had to choose, this is the priority. The fact that now you've made more particles have the right amount of energy, and we'll talk about that in Maxwell Boltzmann curves in a little bit. Yes, Poncho. But do you really care the case, or when you increase the when you change the temperature, you're changing the and you can't really control what you're doing? Um, wait, say that again? Like, when you change the temperature, do you get a choice of whether it goes into the energy of the particle? No, both do change. Okay. But when you're talking about which factor has more of an impact on the increase in reaction rate when you increase the temperature, it's because more particles have the right amount of energy. Not that there's more collisions. Yes, Tyler. How can you, is there any method to increase activation energy without increasing particles? That, that's where we're about to get to. Hey, so Tyler asks, is there a factor that manipulates activation energy without changing the number of collisions? Okay, and so that is our fifth factor. Okay. So the fifth factor is something that manipulates activation energy without changing the number of collisions. Does anyone know what that is? Catalyst. Catalyst. Okay, so. A catalyst. Okay. So. A catalyst. Thank you very much. So, a catalyst, okay, um, lowers the activation energy of a reaction by providing an alternate pathway. Okay, so you're not ch changing the number of collisions now, you're just making more of the collisions successful, okay? So a catalyst lowers the activation energy, so more particles have the activation energy, but you're not changing how many times they collide. You're just making more successful collisions. And so if you go back to the concept of that reaction energy diagram, <coughs> here we might have a normal reaction that takes one step here, which has this, but we might have a catalyst that instead of doing it in one step, breaks it into two smaller steps and then lowers the maximum activation energy required for the reaction to occur. In higher level, we'll talk about this a little more, but yeah, a catalyst doesn't just lower the hump. I mean, yes, in simplified terms, you could just draw one hump there, but in reality, when we're actually talking about what's happening, it makes an, a step in between, okay? So this would be your catalyst. So you could draw it as two humps or draw it as one if they just want to show you, if you just want to show how a catalyst works. But the idea is that the amount of energy required to reach the energy, um, the activate complex or transition state is lowered. And that's why a catalyst is effective, okay? Okay. The thing with a catalyst, though, is just because it makes a reaction faster, it doesn't actually affect, this is kind of tied to the top, top stuff, it doesn't affect the equilibrium. It doesn't affect how much reaction products you have. It just allows you to get there faster. Questions about the five factors that affect reaction rates. Okay. So those are the main ideas for... Um, that. Now, what we have to talk about here is now graphically analyzing and how do we um, experimentally collect data on reaction rates. Okay, and so the next section here will be data collection. for reaction rates, okay? Now, like we said before, you have to find a way to measure something over unit time. You can measure 
change in volume, like if you're producing a gas, you can do change in mass. Again, if you're producing a gas, you can do change in color, like measure how long it takes for the color to change. You could also do things like change in conductivity, which involves a change in number of ions in solution. So if you start making a product that has less charged ions, you could measure how the conductivity increases or decreases. Or you could even do a measure, a change in pH. If the products like neutralize or the products form an acid or a base, you could measure those things. Now, for the IB, there, while you, have, you can list these ways to measure change in reaction rate, the first two are the ones that we really focus on because they're the easiest to graph and they're the easiest to kind of see what's going on. Uh, concentration, there's a couple different ways you can measure that. You can measure that in, um, in color change or, or conductivity and things like that. But like just, there's not, a, uh, there's not necessarily a tool that measures that unless it's specific ions that you like have a probe to do that. But so. Let's say you had a carbon dioxide probe. Yes, yeah, so you could, probe, right? yeah, if you had like a calcium ion probe, you could do that, yes. But the graphs that I've seen the most are change in volume or like change in mass graphs. So, for example, let's say you're collecting, okay, you're reacting magnesium metal with hydrochloric acid. And you're forming okay. So let's pretend you're reacting this and you're forming hydrogen gas, okay? If you collect the volume over time, you're gonna get a, a graph that looks a little like this. Now, a couple things to note about that. Bless you. HCl has to be the limiting reactant here, okay? And so HCO is really reactive because you need to make sure that you kind of end up using all of the, re um, the reactant here to produce the max amount of H2 gas. Okay. So that way it directly affects how much gas and how fast it's being made. So this is, this would be, let's say, a volume versus time curve. Okay. A couple of things to talk about here. Okay, one, you can find the rate of reaction at any given point in time by doing the tangent line to that curve. That's the slope at that point. And so if you want to find, let's say at this time, the, the rate at that given time, you just take the slope the rise over run at that point. So drawing a tangent line to that point gives you the rate at that given time. Sorry, go. Yeah, take one. Is the x and y axis And when you're collecting gas, it's either gonna be volume versus time or mass for change in mass versus time, yes. Okay, so. Any point here gets you the reaction rate. You could do the initial reaction rate by doing the tangent line to the initial point. But any of those points you could find out the reaction rate for, and you're expected to be able to do that. They'll give you a graph that's easy enough to read. You'll have like grid lines, and so you could like be able to find the rise over run very easily, or at least get very close to it, okay? And you'll have a ruler on the test too, so you can draw tangent lines and things like that. So, you will be provided enough information and enough of a leeway and range for your answer to get it correct. Now, this plateau here, okay, 
Why does it plateau at this point? Because the slope Okay, yes, the slope is zero, you're but chemically, you're, you're, running out you're running out of reactants. So you've used up. HCl and limiting reactant. You've used all of that up. Okay. Now, <coughs> in terms of what we've talked about so far, okay, why is the shape of this curve this way? Why is it curved like that? Why is it not just linear? What is happening on a molecular level that's causing this curve here? Chloe? Okay, right, so as a reaction occurs, there's fewer and fewer um, reactive molecules left, so the frequency of successful collisions is decreasing, so your reaction rate <coughs> will always decrease until it reaches a, a rate of zero, when you run out of everything. Okay, so you're, you're decreasing, decreasing the frequency of successful collisions. And again, the frequency thing is a, a big thing. A lot of kids will say, you're running out of reactant particles. That's not the idea. The idea is that because you have fewer reactant particles, the frequency of successful collisions is decreasing. Therefore, the rate at which it's going is decreasing. We may go a little bit over for SLT, I apologize, but there's two more things I really want to talk about. So, I know. Thank you. Okay. So, another graph that's really popular, using the volume versus um, time graph, and I would draw a separate one for this, because this is just labeling parts of this, but this next one is going to be <coughs> manipulating the shape of the curve. Okay, and so that's what, that's what we're going to talk about next. And so I would draw this one kind of big because you're going to be drawing a bunch of different curves on it. Okay. Let's assume, for our sake, just the same reaction here. And we're collecting H2 gas over time. Okay. Let's give our initial curve... like this. And let's say this curve is produced when we have a limiting reactive HCl that is 50 centimeters cubed of one molar HCl. So let's say a student reacted 50 centimeters cubed of one molar HCl with excess magnesium and they got this curve. They generated this curve here. Okay. What we're going to do now is we're going to manipulate fact, we're going to manipulate aspects of that HCl and see how that affects our curve because it will affect our curve because it will affect our reaction rate because we said a variety of things that are affecting our reaction rate and things like that. Okay, the question is this. The first question. Okay. What happens? And I'm going to draw this separately over to the side so it doesn't tell you like where the answer is, but then I'll move it to where it is. But let's say Let's say in the next scenario, instead of using 50 centimeters cubed of one molar, I use 25 centimeters cubed of the same one molar. How does that affect the curve, Dana? Well, you'd need more time to get to the end point. Would you get to the same amount as the first one? No. How, where would you end up? Well, no, no, like oh, up. Like lower, lower. How much lower? Half. So the one, one characteristic of this graph would be that it will end up somewhere half of where it's going to be. Okay. Now the question is this. Is the rate of reaction going to be slower or faster in this scenario? Okay, Tyler, why do you say same? Because... Um, you're still going to have your same frequency of collisions. You're just going to run out sooner. Exactly. You're going to end up at the same point. The concentration is what affects the rate of reaction, not the amount you have in there, but the concentration. So because you still have the same amount of particles per unit volume, 
you're gonna have the same frequency of collision. So in, in other words, when you start drawing this, it will start with the same rate and then it will end up leveling out earlier like this. But the initial rate, the beginning of it has to be the same speed because it's the same molarity. Okay? Do you all see what we're kind of doing here? We're manipulating things and seeing how it affects the curve. And so the initial rate of both of these are the same because it's one molar. Yes, Chloe. So when does the rate of reaction start to die here? Uh, that's a good question. I think you just try to draw it as naturally as you can. So like, there's not a given time where you say, I have to split it here, okay? Um, I would just, I would just focus on the first part of the line being the same and the end point being correct and then whatever way the curve takes you from the rest of it is okay. Okay, now, scenario number two, okay? Okay, in this scenario, I have 50 centimeters cubed of 0.5 molar HCl, and that's my limiting reactant, okay? So can someone tell me one aspect of this curve that I need to make sure I represent, Dane? <coughs> how, how would I represent the initial rate? It's not as steep. It's not as steep. In fact, we would say it's probably half as steep. Okay, so the first part of this will be something like that. Okay, not as steep. Okay, Tyler, what's the other aspect? You're okay. going to end up with the same flow. And of which one? Of your 50 centimeter. Why? Because you still have your same amount of HCl. You Do you have the same amount of HCl? Oh, you don't have the same, you have less moles. You have less moles because you have the same volume but you have lower concentration, so you have less moles. Are you going to end up? Is the ratio work out that you end up at the 25? The ratio works out that you end up at the 25. Because 25 centimeters times one molar is the same number of moles as 50 times 0.5. Exactly. So this will look like that. Okay? Yes, Tamor. Uh, would we ever get like a weird number of Oh, what's it called? Like, instead of 0.5, would it be like 0.7? Um, okay, that's a good question. I would say, if they ever gave you that, the mark scheme would just say, did, does the student's final point um, end up lower than the top one? But they won't measure how much lower it is. Okay. So, but I would say, most of the time, it's usually half or a quarter, or something that's easy to kind of represent. So there's no confusion. Perfect. Okay. So, let me ask you this, okay? What kind of HCl would you need to generate the following curve? Okay, hold on, hold on. Don't, don't everyone blur out once. Take a second to look at the curve and um, think about that and make sure that you have an explanation for why you think it would be that way before I call on you. So <coughs> take a second, think about it, okay? Are we calling it double the steepness of the line? Sure. Okay. Look, I understand instincts and I understand your kind of gut reaction to a lot of problems, but what you've got to understand is this. Not everything is always what it appears, so you have to make sure you're very, very careful. Take your time for these kind of questions. What I need to impart on you is that the IB exam is designed to give you plenty of time to think about all the questions. I don't think you'll ever run out of time on the test. If you have accommodations, that's a different thing, and you should still have plenty of time. But they give you, on multiple choice, they give you a minute and 20 seconds every single multiple choice. That doesn't seem like a lot, but it is actually quite a significant amount of time for a question. And so don't, don't try to rush through a question. Make sure that you are able to explain to yourself why you're choosing a question because, again, the IB is preying on the fact that 
certain students um, have things memorized in a certain way and they automatically assume that whenever they see something that's similar to that, they know the answer already. Okay, Mevsim. Um, 25 centimeters cubed. Uh, 2 more. Okay, so Mevsim says 25 centimeters cubed of 2 molar. Why Mevsim? Yes, correct. But it has to end up at the same level. Exactly. So in these graphs, there's two major concepts like Mevsim outlined that you have to think about. One is the steepness of the original of the curve, which has to do with molarity. So this section right here has to do with the molarity, which relates to the reaction rate. But then Mesum said, well, I know the molarity is higher, but because I end up at the same point, then I must have the same number of moles of reactant in my reaction. So this curve is based on two aspects, the initial part with the molarity and the final part with the moles. So understanding that allows you to kind of manipulate curves whichever way you want. Yes? So basically if the volume and the Exactly, because that's what that is, right? Molarity times volume is moles. So that's the same concept. Now, I don't have to convert to decimeters cubed here because I'm just looking at it conceptually. If I wanted to actually figure out how many moles I was reacting, then yes, I'd convert to decimeters cubed. Yes? Um, how steep can the um, graph actually go? Because, for example, what if you have theoretically one centimeter cubed of 50 moles? <laughs> okay. That, I mean, I see what you're saying. Theoretically, if that were the case, it, oh, sorry. Um, you, you would try to make it as steep as you possibly could to show that. Like, it would be almost vertical that point. That's not really possible in HCL, but yeah, I understand the concept, yes. So, like Mofe said, you want to just try to reflect the steepness to show that you understand the relationship between, between the original one and the final one. So, this is, a, this is a question I've seen on short answer, and I've also seen this multiple choice. What they'll do is they'll give you like four different curves and say, this is curve A, B, C, and D. Which curve matches this set of information? Which curve matches this set of information? You just have to choose. And so um, that is um, a very important concept here, okay? And again, I think my theory in a lot of the sh multiple choice, like I've said before, is the IB, writes multiple choice questions by taking previous short answer questions and turning them into multiple choice questions. And so what they do, they look through previous students' <coughs> answers on short answer, bless you, and they just take the three most commonly misconception, um, most common misconceptions and make those the answer choices on the multiple choice. Because no need to try to think of what students are gonna do, sh you just take what they, you have evidence from and you make those the choices. So. That way, if a student is taking multiple choice and they have a misconception, they'll find their answer on there. It's tricky, but it's smart um, because it helps weed out students that don't 100% understand things. Yes, Mancho? What year is this in the, like, the chemistry rotation? Like, you know uh, we are in kind of right in the middle. I think we're year four or five, right? Uh, year four. Yeah. I believe four or five. They change every seven years. Right? Every seven years, yeah. So I think 2022. We'll start a new curriculum. Okay. Questions on this? Okay. One last thing for SL, and then we will take a break for um, before we do HL. Okay. The last thing we want to talk about, okay, is um, Maxwell Boltzmann curves. Okay. Now. Okay. Maxwell Boltzmann curves are designed to show the distribution of kinetic energy or velocity, if you really want to um, you can say that, um, of particles in a system. And so, in a system of substance, of particles, not every particle is going the same at speed. Not every particle going has the same amount of kinetic energy. 
because temperature is an average of the kinetic energy of the particles. And so, much like on a freeway when you have a bunch of cars traveling, bless you, um, they don't all travel the same speed, but there are certain speeds that are the most popular speeds and that affects your average the most. And so, a Maxwell-Boltzmann curve, okay, looks like this, okay? The y-axis is um, number of particles with um, that specific kinetic energy. And then the x-axis is either kinetic energy or sometimes they'll say velocity because velocity and kinetic energy are directly related. So you can <coughs> say either one because the particles are all the same mass, so they're technically directly related, but either way. Okay. Now, this distribution looks like this. Okay, it, yeah, it's a, it is kind of bell curved, but it's not always symmetrical. So that's the thing I want to kind of stress here. I just kind of drew one right in the middle because we're going to talk about how to manipulate that curve as well. So this curve has a certain amount of kinetic energy. And if you notice, most of the particles have a kinetic energy in this region right here. We don't have to put a number next to it. It's a conceptual graph, okay? <laughs> so the temperature, the average temperature would probably be somewhere a little bit past that curve because you have particles higher, which kind of shift that curve, a l of it, the average a little bit further to the right. Now, always start at zero, zero. So you should have no particles at zero, kinetic energy, and then draw a curve like this. And the end doesn't really touch the line, it just kind of approaches the line. So kind of keep that in mind as well. Now, if that is a sample at a certain temperature, okay, how does this curve change if the temperature increases? Okay, Poncho. Like you push the, the bell kind of? Okay. I don't know how else to explain it. The peak. The peak shifts over to the right. Okay. So it looks like this. Or wait, does it go off that? Okay. Well, let's pretend. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. okay, Mofe, what do you say? It lowers. it lowers it because what does the area under the, the curve represent? The amount, of the amount of particles. So if you're going to stretch it further, you can't have it the same height. So you have to make it lower. So if you're going to draw this, it's going to look like that. So, oh, if I increase temperature. So this is T2, which is an increase in temperature. And like Mofe said, the area underneath the curve, area under curve, is number of particles. So unless you're changing the amount of particles, which you're not going to, the area underneath the curve needs to look approximately the same if you're gonna change the shape of the curve. So the IB will say, when you sketch one, if they ask you to sketch a higher temperature, they'll say, look for if the student shifted the peak to the right and the peak is lower than the original peak. Okay, those are the two main concepts here. So now we have more particles at higher kinetic energy. But yes, sorry about Yes. The one thing I don't understand about that is doesn't that technically mean you have less particles, like all of a sudden you have particles at absolute zero? Because at the top of your peak, that's how many particles with kinetic energy you have. Of that kinetic let's, energy. Let's pretend that's oh, of that particular. Yes, kinetic. it's like a bar graph. Essentially it's a bar graph, but just smoothed out as a curve. Okay, so it's not just a scale. Not correct. You can't just say it's 10 and now all of a sudden you have five particles. No, correct, yeah. Okay. okay. Now. In a colder temperature, how's that curve going to look? It's, it's kind of a more narrow and it's going to be higher. So you're going to see something like this. Is it not like symmetrical? No. You don't need to have it symmetrical because at lower temperatures, it's more packed in that way. It's not, a, it's not an even distribution. So that's why 
the other ones haven't been as symmetrical here. And so um, it will stretch out and it will, um, in this one, it's more condensed. But no, you shouldn't have to, you don't have to make it symmetrical. Okay. So that's the first aspect of maxwell voltage curve, representing the distribution of kinetic energies in a system by changing the shape of the curve. Okay. The second part of this graph is representing kinetic um, activation energy on this curve, on these curves. And so activation energy on the maxwell boltzmann is an arbitrary line. Okay, there's not any kind of necessarily method to where you have to draw it, but it is an arbitrary vertical line that represents the kinetic energy the particle needs to have to react. So every particle to the right of that line has the amount of energy required for a reaction to occur. So if you notice, as my temperature increases, the area past that line increases. Yes, Taymor? How do we know where that line is? Okay, it's arbitrary. So you don't have to, like, there's not a method. You just draw it somewhere, and that's where you establish it as. Okay, so they're not going to say, like, like, draw it at this kinetic energy. They'll say, draw it at, show the activation energy on the, um, the graph and you just draw a line. What they'll probably do then is then say, show the activation energy when a catalyst is introduced compared to that um, original activation energy. So where is the line for the catalyzed activation energy on this graph? Left, because it's going to reduce the requirement. And so this would be, okay, so, so here, bless you, activation energy. This area over here is reacting. A catalyst, notice, doesn't change the particles in any way. It just lowers the requirement. So now these particles are qualified to react as well. Okay. So that's the main thing I want you to focus on with maxwell Boltzmann curves. Because it's not necessarily the accuracy of how well you draw your curves, but Parts of it are important. Do you start at zero, zero? Is your peak lower or higher relative to the original temperature? Is it more spread out or more condensed? And how does activation energy reflect on there? So a lot of students mix, the most common mistake is a lot of students mix this up with the reaction energy diagram, okay? Because the reaction energy diagram is a, still a curve, but it's from reactants to products versus this, which is just showing the energy of a substance, yes? Will they ever have one of these problems where, like, besides there being a shift in temperatures, there's also a change in, like, volume? No. The Maxwell-Boltzmann curve is only designed to represent the energy of the particles. That's it. So, um, Pancho asked, will other factors that affect reaction rate affect your Maxwell-Boltzmann curve? No. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. That is the end of the SL portion. I'm going to stop recording for a second.